So thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here and to give you um, another example of what I hope to demonstrate is really good teamwork. So I'm basically a clinical doctor. I work in the trust. My role as Director of Infection Prevention and Control is about the prevention of healthcare associated infections. So it's about making sure that patients who come into the trust don't develop something else as a result of them being in the trust. And part of my team are up there in the front row. Give us a wave. <laughs> okay, so what we're gonna talk about today um, is um, an outbreak that we had in the trust of a fungus called Candida auris. And so we're gonna talk about Candida auris and I'll talk to you about why it's a super fungus, how it affected us in the trust and how it affected some of our patients. And then David will go on to talk to you about how we investigated things further and eventually worked out ways of controlling the outbreak. So Candida auris is a yeast. Now, a lot of people in this room will be familiar with the concept of a, a yeast infection or thrush, something like that. But this is genuinely a, what we think is a new species of yeast. Um, it was first described actually in 2009, and that initiated a bit of a look back, and people actually found that it had been identified back as far as 1996 in South Korea, but that makes it a pretty new bug as far as we're concerned. But interestingly, we can look at the genes of these bugs, and David will talk to you more about that, but the genetic analysis showed that Candida auris bizarrely appeared to have emerged simultaneously in different parts of the world on different continents. And we now see it in South Asia, South Africa, South America, and East Asia, with spread to us in Europe. And this is what we call an emerging pathogen, because what we now see are hospital outbreaks across the world occurring with Candida auris. But it seems to have a particular um, predilection for spreading in intensive care settings and on people who are not unwell. It's probably of no consequence whatsoever, um, <clears throat> as are many other candida infections. I think one of the difficulties that we've had worldwide is that it requires quite specialist laboratory methods for identification, and it's often been misidentified as something else. Um, but we've been lucky in Oxford in that we've got very much uh, a state-of-the-art microbiology laboratory and we have been able to identify it without any difficulty. The reason that we worry about it is that it's one of these um, bugs that we would call multi-drug resistant. You hear more and more in the news about bacteria that are difficult to treat because we're running out of antibiotics. This candida um, is intrinsically resistant, meaning that all of them are resistant to a large number of our routine first-line antifungal drugs. Some people in the room may have had a drug called fluconazole, for example, and this, uh, this candida is resistant to fluconazole and many of the drugs related to fluconazole. So the other thing that it can do is it can acquire resistance when on treatment to further antifungal agents. So this is certainly something that we want to protect our patients from acquiring so that we don't put them in a very difficult position of having an untreatable infection. The other thing that worried us greatly when we first realised that we may have a problem with this in Oxford is that if you look at the, uh, the literature and the reports of outbreaks, they reported very, very high mortality rates up to 50% of patients were being reported in the literature as dying as a result of Candida auris infection. Clearly massive concern. And I will show you data that in fact, in our trust, this was not uh, how things played out at all. One of the other problems when we first had a problem with this fungus, and I'll take you through all the problems that we had, is that we didn't know how to control it. And all the standard advice was based on the kind of advice we hear for how to prevent patients getting, for example, MRSA or other multi-drug resistant bacteria. So what we call contact precautions, isolating patients, wearing additional protective equipment, um, additional cleaning in the units where patients are based. So when did we realize Candida auris was a problem in the UK? Well, I don't know if any of you are Telegraph readers. It's not the paper I normally read, so I didn't read this and didn't know about it. 
but the Brompton Hospital in London, their cardiothoracic unit, had um, they, they get a number of patients into their unit, a highly specialist unit from abroad, and presumably one or more of those patients had brought Candida auris into their unit, and it spread in their unit, and they had great difficulty controlling it. They even went to the extent of uh, closing their intensive care unit after three patients died. So this was the first time, really, that as a, as a nation we became aware that this had been a problem. And at the same time, they published in the academic literature um, a report of their outbreak. Um, and at that time, it was the largest described case series, and it was the first time that it had been seen in Europe. And they had 50 patients with Candida auris detected. And by detected, I don't mean that it was necessarily causing harm. So this could just be on a routine skin swab that it had been detected, or in fact on a screening swab in the same way that we screen up the nose for MRSA. But they did have almost half of their patients who did appear to have possible or proven clinical infection with Candida auris. And when they looked at the genetics of this Candida auris, it did seem to be um, the same bug coming from the same geographical region. And that got us thinking, because actually this was a bug that we'd seen a couple of times in Oxford. When I say a couple of times, I personally had seen a couple of cases, but hadn't really thought too hard about it. We're a big hospital, there's a lot of us, but we went back and had a look, and actually, to my great surprise and shock, we'd actually had nine cases. So clearly, we needed to do something about that. So our look back exercise, going back through our databases, identified four patients who had had Candida auris just on um, what I call a superficial or non-significant clinical sample, hadn't caused them any harm. But we had had five patients who had had um, samples either from neurological specimens or from bloodstream specimens. And what tied those patients together was that they had all been cared for on our neurological intensive care unit apart from one patient. And while we were in the process of doing this, look back and thinking about it, we had another patient with a bloodstream infection. At that point, we were able to get some data from Public Health England, who informed us that all our Candida auris strains were South African. So now we're really getting very worried. We do seem to have a problem on our hands. And so we took, undertook a number of different measures. So, some of you will know our Neurological Intensive Care Unit quite well, and others will, will have no idea. It's a great big barn-like building. It's very open plan. And this is a sort of bird's eye view of the unit. All those little blue squares are beds. And you walk in on the right where it says main entrance, and there's a row of beds all neatly spaced apart. And in between them, there, there's some furniture, which uh, holds patient stocks and bits and pieces. Um, and then at the bottom of the picture, you can see we've got three isolation rooms. And then on the left-hand side of the picture, you can see an office area. And it was very common at the time of the outbreak for people to use the neurological intensive care unit as a bit of a corridor. Um, we were also, at that time, in the process of switching from paper records to electronic records, and the unit on the whole was quite cluttered and crowded. So we spent quite a lot of time down there, having a look at the unit, having a think about what was going on, taking advice, and we implemented a whole raft of infection prevention and control measures. So the first thing we did was we put in a patient screening programme, Initially, we started screening once a, once a week, and then we increased that to three times weekly, and I'll explain why on one of the next slides. And we also did some environmental screening, which I'll take you through. In terms of patient care, as I said earlier, we didn't really know exactly what to do, but we put in um, isolation or cohorting of positive patients. As members of staff, we all wore long sleeve gowns, aprons, really emphasized the importance of hand washing, um, reducing um, contacts between patients. We made sure that when patients were leaving our units, we let the uh, receiving ward, which was sometimes in another hospital, we let them know that this was a patient who was colonised with Candida auris. We changed the medication that we use at the beginning of an operation to prevent infection. 
If we knew our patient was colonised, we gave them additional antifungal medication to make sure that the operation that they had was safe. And where possible, we brought in single-use equipment, for example, blood pressure cuffs. We spent a lot of time talking to staff on the unit, and Ruth, up at the top there, particularly spent a lot of time down on the unit just talking to people, helping to reinforce all these procedures, and just trying to get some ideas of what they thought was going on. Because as you will see, this wasn't something that was short-lived. It wasn't something that we were quickly able to take control of. In terms of the uh, environment of the neuro ITU as a whole, we cleaned it more. It smelled very strongly of chlorine for several months. We decluttered the unit. We got rid of all the paper, all the bits of equipment that didn't need to be there, just to make the unit easier to clean and just to remind people about the importance of cleanliness. Um, I've talked about between the patient beds there being bits of furniture where we store various items. We minimise the number of items that were stored there. When the patient left the unit, everything there was thrown away. Um, and on the unit, it's quite common to use um, um, blankets that contain warmed air to keep patients at the right temperature. We were concerned about air currents and movements spreading candida from one patient to another, and also fans, so we removed all of those things. We also spent a lot of time on the phone and a lot of time in meetings. There was huge national interest in this, particularly from Public Health England, um, and they spent a lot of time advising us what to do. Some of that was quite frustrating because they'd actually never dealt with anything like this before. Some of it was incredibly productive because they came up to the unit and helped us. So um, a bit of a mixed picture there, but a lot of time talking about things, making sure that all the right people are involved and informed. And at that time, as well as the Brompton, there was another hospital, King's College Hospital in London, who also had an outbreak. And I shared a lot of information and spent a lot of time talking to doctors from those trusts as well. So I talked about patient screening. Now, we only started screening really on the far right-hand side of this graph. So what you see with the, uh, the left-hand side where you've just got one or two patients, these are the cases that we'd had when we hadn't realised there was something going on. So we'd had cases over 18 months, but they'd never crossed over with each other on the ward. They'd all just come and gone. But then we started screening, and we very quickly realised we had a huge problem. Um, which is why we went from screening weekly to three times a week. We needed to work out very quickly whether our patients were colonised. And all these patients who are in blue are not coming to any harm, they're just colonised. But we needed to make sure that we were keeping them safe and keeping patients who weren't colonised safe. And we did a lot of environmental screening. I and mean, one of the most useful people who came in to help us was a chap called Peter Hoffman from Public Health England. And he said to us right at the beginning, in terms of looking at the environment, you won't find very much. But you need to look at the equipment that's moving between patients. So we very much concentrated on equipment that's touched a lot of time by staff. And I talked to the staff and I said, what do you touch a lot? And we talked about computer screens, ventilator monitors, bed rails. Um, what you, you've got there a picture of the equipment we use to measure blood glucose. That goes between patients. You've got a pulse oximeter up there on the right-hand side, and that sits on the patient's index finger for 24 hours a day, and a blood pressure cuff. And we screened over several different time periods, and we used lots and lots of different methods of screening, because, again, nobody really knew exactly how to screen and what to do. But we went as far as taking the sinks apart and looking in the waste traps of the sinks to see if we could find it there. And it was really hard to find. Uh, Peter Hoffman was right. Very, very hard to find in the general environment or in the air. But fairly soon after the outbreak had started, I did get it on one of those pulse oximeters. And I then went round and sampled a further 12 pulse oximeters. And I sampled ones that were in storage. I sampled ones that were literally on patients. I took them off the patients and I sampled them. Some of those patients I knew were colonized with Candida auris and others weren't. I couldn't find another isolate. We found it on one settle plate. And I think I've got a picture. Yeah, this is a picture at the bottom of a settle plate. So it's just one of our agar plates that we have in the laboratory. And what you do is you just leave it with the lid off 
on the floor underneath the bed or maybe up on a monitor and you're just waiting to see if there are any bugs in the air and if they settle on the plate. And I had one settle plate out of 16 with one colony of Candida auris, so clearly not very much in the air. And that settle plate had come from underneath the bed of a patient who was quite heavily colonised with Candida auris, and he'd had his bed remade and obviously a lot of skin scales and things flying about. So really quite hard to find. So we didn't really know what to do, and we screened again, looking at high touch points. We looked at curtains, hoists, transfer bags, everything that the staff on the unit thought was something they touched a lot. I looked at bed rails. And by this point, of course, we're cleaning very intensively. The unit is spick and span. I couldn't culture anything at all, never mind Candida auris from any of the surfaces. But look at this, the outbreak is going on. So we're getting really very worried by this point doesn't seem to be anything we do. The unit, the nurses are working so hard to keep those patients isolated and safe. Um, and as you can see, we haven't had a significant clinical infection since back in November, but the number of patients who are so-called colonised with Candida auris just goes on. We've now become the biggest outbreak in Europe. And in April 2017, We've got some different environmental specialists in, um, and they're the people who came and sampled lots of air samples for us. But they also um, had a look at our temperature probes. Because one of our nurses said, you know, Katie, we've got these, these temperature probes, and it's this thing at the bottom, that just sit in the patient's axilla for days. So that little um, silver thermistor at the bottom monitors the patient's temperature continuously. And we took one of those temperature probes, and we laid it onto an agar plate, and that picture at the top is Candida auris, just growing straight off one of those temperature probes. And we thought, well, that's very interesting. We also did manage to find one colony um, swabbing a, a, a hoist that had been used to, to lift a patient. So um, we then went back and we had 10 temperature probes on the unit. Um, and I was able to culture Candida auris from four of those temperature probes. And so we took the probes, um, and, the, and the other thing that I'd like to say f about the temperature probes is I only grew Candida auris. I didn't grow any other Candida species, which you'd expect to find much more commonly in patients. You'd expect to find Candida albicans and much more usual things. But there's something about this Candida. It sticks to the temperature probes much better than other bugs, which appear to be much more easily cleaned off. And this is an electron micrograph of the surface of one of those temperature probes. And those lovely round blobs that you see are Candida auris. Have I got a pointer? Not sure I have. Right at the bottom, just for size, there's a couple of gram-negative bacteria in a, in a little row, right in the middle at the bottom, so that gives you some idea of size. So these blobby candida are a bit bigger than gram-negative bugs. So we took the probes away. Um, unfortunately, um, a few of them snuck back in again. Um, but it did appear, when we took the probes away, that we had fewer cases. So we removed all of the probes, and we did have a couple more cases, but then it disappeared, and I made absolutely sure they couldn't use any of those temperature probes ever again. So that got me thinking, because I'm very lucky in microbiology. The other side of our corridor has the RBRC Modernising Medical Microbiology Group, and I've got a great group of friends, statisticians, microbiologists, modelers. And I said to them, look, I think this is the temperature probes, but I think, you know, we need to prove it. It is usual that the first site that the patient is colonised is the axilla where the temperature probe sits, but that's not really enough. Can we do a bit more? Can we do a case control study? Can we take things further? So at that point, I'm going to hand over to David. Thanks very much, Katie, and just to add my thanks for being here. Um, so talk to you about how we managed to pin it on the probes, or, or how do we get more evidence that these temperature probes were, were really important? 
So what we were interested in is sort of looking to see, could we see were there specific things that the patients who got candida auris, um, specific risk factors that they had experienced that patients who didn't get candida auris hadn't experienced? Or were there specific things that the, the patients who didn't get candida auris were exposed to protective factors? And we, so we said that anyone who got candida auris, whether it was the cause of an infection or, or just sitting on their skin, we defined them as a case. And then anyone that we tested for candida auris, and we tested them at least once and they'd been negative, and they'd never had a positive, we, we used those as our, our control patients to compare to. And what we were able to do through um, an initiative set up through the BRC was to look back at anonymised electronic healthcare records. So as part of the BRC's antimicrobial resistance and, and modernising medical microbiology theme, we, we've set up something called the Infections in Oxfordshire Research Database. And this contained a number of things which were really helpful for us to work out what was going on. So we knew the dates and times that people had come to the hospital and to particular wards, so including our... Uh, neurosciences intensive care unit and then we knew something about the patients who were there what what how ill were they what tests that they had done what medicines were they given what what procedures did they did they undergo as well and so what we could do is then look back over the period of 90 days before patients either got diagnosed with candida auris or, or when we last knew they were negative for our control patients extract data from the database on patients like this and search for things that were more common in the cases than the controls and to do this within a framework of statistical analysis. And we found a few things. So here, um, if the line's above one, that means that your risk's increased. If the line's below one, your risk is, is decreased compared to, compared to the, the, the one line. Um, and what we've got plotted along the, along the graph there at the bottom is the uh, length of time you spent on our neurosciences ICU. And, and what you can see is that as patients stayed there longer, their risk increased. And that, for most of our patients, was the case. There were a few patients who stayed a very long time, and actually their risk was slightly less. But the really interesting thing that we found was is that if we looked at the temperature probes, 86% of our, our cases had been exposed to the temperature probes, whereas only 34% of our control patients had. Uh, and when we put this into our statistical model, what we were able to say is that even after we accounted for how unwell people were, why they were on the ICU, etc., that actually, if you, had these can if you had these temperature probes, you were more than seven times more likely to acquire candida auris. Because we continued to screen people once they were positive, we could say something about the sort of average length of time that, that patients stayed positive. And when we tested patients in quick succession, we found that any one test we did um, didn't pick up candida auris all the time. It had about an 80% chance of picking it up. So we decided that we needed multiple negative tests to be confident that it had gone. So if we defined clearance as two or even three negative tests, then we could see that most of our patients remained with candida auris on their skin for up to around two months. The other thing we were able to do was to try and understand the genetic code of the candida auris that was in the outbreak to try and track how it had spread. So candida auris, is, its genetic code consists of some DNA. There's tw about 12 million A's, C's, G's and T's that make it up. And when we look at candida auris down the microscope, it looks like these blue dots here in the sense that it just looks the same. But what we're able to do by looking at the genetic code is to actually break it down into related groups. So rather than just having a whole load of blue dots, we now have got all the different colours that you can see. And where things are the same colour, we'd be able to relate them as uh, having been uh, possibly transmitted from one patient to another. And where they're all different colours, we could say that recent transmission was really very unlikely. And, and so this sort of illustrates that, that point. And how do we actually get this DNA? So we grow Candida auris in the lab. Um, we can then break open the yeasts um, and then extract their DNA in liquid form and put it on a sequencing machine. And what this does is turn that liquid DNA into a string of A, C's, G's and T's that we can then read on a computer. These are little fragments of the sequence. They're not the whole thing. So we have to sort of piece them together rather like a, a jigsaw puzzle. And then having done that, we can then go on to do some downstream analysis. So we had 
not all the samples from the patients, but quite a lot of them were saved. And so we were able, from 79 samples and from six samples from the environment, to compare them and to compare them to previous uh, Candida auris DNA from around the world. And what you can see there in the, in the darker blue is that our Oxford strains all look really, really very similar in this sort of family tree depiction um, of, uh, to the Candida that was found in South Africa. And the Candida that was found in different parts of the world all looked quite different to what we had in Oxford. And you can take this a little bit further and actually, because we can work out how quickly Candida auris changes or how quickly it evolves, we can then time when it likely came to Oxford and we could time that to around 2012 or, or 2013. And I don't expect you to see the details here, but I'll just point out some of the things that we noticed. So these are all the different samples that, that we had on our intensive care unit. And I'll just highlight for you that actually patients were often colonised with not just one type of Candida auris, but, but multiple types. Uh, and similarly, the temperature probes in green there were colonised with multiple types as well. And then if we looked over the whole tree, what we found was that reusable patient equipment sequences were right throughout this, this family tree of patient sequences. So what we could see is that there was a lot of mixing between the Candida auris that was on these bits of equipment and what we were finding in the patients. The final piece of the puzzle was to look and see, well, was there a relationship between how closely your, each Candida infection was related genetically and how close patients have been in terms of their bed spaces? And we couldn't find any relationship there at all. So there wasn't a strong signal for this spreading one patient to the next in adjacent space. This appeared to be something that was being spread around the unit as a whole. So the end of the outbreak, as, as Casey's shown you, once the temperature probes were removed, actually we had a few more cases, but then no more cases since November of 2017. And this is really quite a remarkable success story because actually many other countries in the world have not been able to completely control outbreaks like this and it's gone on to be a persistent problem. So in the summary here, we've got one of the largest outbreaks of Candida auris described anywhere worldwide that's been successfully controlled. And these temperature probes appear to be really important in it and how it was transmitted. And this information has not only helped stop Candida auris spreading here, but it's actually gone on to help hospitals around the world try and stop the superfungus spreading further. Lots of people to acknowledge this is really, as Katie says, a, a big team effort to control this. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>